It's Behind the Headlines on WLIWFM. This is our weekly compendium of the week's news, a deeper dive with some of the award-winning journalists from throughout the East End. I'm Joe Shaw. I'm the executive editor of the Express News Group. We publish the Southampton Press, the East Hampton Press, the Sag Farber Express, 27East.com, and Express Magazine. Uh, my co-host is Bill Sutton. He's the managing editor of the Express News Group. Hey, Bill. Good morning, Joe. Good morning, everybody. Good to have you. We have a great panel this week. We have J.D. Allen, who's the managing editor of WSHU Public Radio. Good morning, J.D. Hey, thanks for having me. Appreciate you coming over. We have Denise Civiletti, who's the editor of Riverhead Local. Hey, Denise. Good morning. And we have Beth Young, who's the editor of the East End Beacon. Hey, Beth. Good morning. Great to have you all here. So let's start with a conversation about BESS. These are battery energy storage systems. And it's becoming a real catchphrase now on the South Fork in particular, but I think throughout the East End, the conversation is beginning. These uh, these systems basically are designed to work with some of the new green energy that's coming in, especially on the South Fork. We're talking about the, the wind farm that's going in off Montauk. Bill, there was a meeting at uh, Southampton Town Hall this week that focused on BESS. Uh, what did people have to say about it? Well, quite a bit, um, uh, apparently. So, um, the 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 meeting, the public hearing, was on a proposed um, moratorium on these systems in Southampton Town, a proposed six month moratorium, while the town um, reviews and and looks at. Uh, I'm not sure. Is it three months? Let's see, there I go. So, a uh, three month moratorium, which hardly seems long enough, um, to look at town's legislation regulating, um, you know, these systems. But the uh, the conversation turned into more of a free for all. There's there's been a proposed um, uh, best system in in Hampton Bays that uh, Hampton Bays community has has strongly uh, been opposed to, and and so the hearing got kind of mixed between um, discussions about the moratorium and this proposed system in uh, in Hampton Bays near the canal that people are very concerned about safety, whether there's, um, you know, the possibility of fires from this system and, and what would happen and just, um, you know, overall concerns. I, I think whenever you have any kind of new technology that that there is concerns, but um, Hampton Bays is, is kind of wondering why that spot and why them and um, and all that. And it's not clear if um, so, so if the if the town doesn't enact a moratorium, it wouldn't necessarily catch this um, this canal project because it's already uh, there's already been an application. It's already in the works. Um, but the the town also talked about a longer a moratorium, extending a moratorium, and and trying to include this um, this project in Hampton Bay. So um, you know. Town didn't quite didn't take action after the hearing. We're kind of curious to see um, how they're going to move forward and and whether this um, this this one proposed system will will get caught up in it. Yeah, just to be clear, I, I think the three month moratorium is on the table right now, and that would exclude the Canal Southampton project because it's already in process. But the the story we had said that uh, the town is actually looking at a six-month moratorium that would include the Canal Southampton problem. Beth, I, I'm curious, you know, when we talk about moratoriums that, that towns pass in order to sort of take a pause while they study something more closely, if you include something that's, it, it's typical to exclude something that's already in the process. And if you do include it, I think we we'll probably just expect a lawsuit, right? Right. And that's one of the reasons they didn't do more at this meeting is they really wanted to check with their lawyer. Um, this, this, um, the, the facility that it would be on the canal is a hundred megawatts. And, um, it was, it's before the planning board and the planning board has issued a negative declaration that they're talking about rescinding, which basically means that they said it didn't need extensive environmental review, but now they're considering saying, Hey, maybe it really does. Um, so that might be really the spot where that would most likely get held up would be if the planning board reversed its its neg deck on that. So mm -hmm. um, uh, it's a lot of environmental lingo, but um, but uh, yeah, uh, I mean, I, I think it's interesting politically too because Cindy McNamara, who's who's running for um, town supervisor, 
is very much in the court of all the residents of Hampton Bays. And um, you know, she jumped up at the meeting and said, I have a six month moratorium that includes that project. And Supervisor Jay Schneiderman jumped up. He said, I have the same thing. Um, <laughs> so, so they're both, you know, I mean, Hampton Bays has been really felt trampled on by Southampton Town lately because of what last year um, with the, the the town uh, was working on a proposed business overlay district there. And the, the, you guys got the, uh, the, the document where they said they were looking to neutralize opposition to neutralize uh, opposition. Yes. So and that's still, base is not happy with people's Hampton ears. Town. Yeah, I think uh, it is still base. Yeah, I agree with can that. I, can I say something about the moratorium thing? Because yeah. um, I, I feel like there's like a whole lot of myth making that has been going on over uh, whether or not you can legally include pending projects in a moratorium. Uh, Riverhead Town Supervisor Yvette Aguiar is very fond of saying, without knowing the law, that you can't do that. Once it's in the pipeline, you can't do that. Uh, there's going to be a lawsuit. Now, you know, we engage in all kinds of law litigation that governments do. People are always suing. That always happens. If you're not going to take any action because there might be a lawsuit, you're probably <laughs> never going to do anything, which okay. maybe would make some people happy. But it, it's very, very well settled law in the state of New York that you you can include if a moratorium is properly written and if it if it meets certain standards you can include pending projects in a moratorium right up until the point of a building permit being issued mm -hmm. this is the highest court in the state has ruled this it's well settled law and yeah maybe they'll sue but you know what they're gonna lose and mm -hmm. uh, you know um that's true of changing zoning when projects are pen, I mean, that's another thing that people here are fond of saying that, you know, well, we can't change the zoning from them because, you know, under out from under them. It's yeah, you, actually, you can, uh, you know, but you need to be acting in, in you know, under under the, under appropriate planning, you know, and you can't just willy nilly do these things. It's so, really more a matter of whether the town has the money to defend itself. Whether or not, and whether they've or got the backbone to do it. Yeah. You know? I mean, or, you know. yeah, willing to take the risk. Yeah. yeah. And willing to stand up to developers, many of whom are, uh, at least around here, you know, their buddies and campaign finances, financiers. Uh, <laughs> but, and I have yeah. to say, in, in this case, there is a pretty decent argument for taking a pause and making sure that the town understands what they're dealing with. Um, some of the, some of the um, testimony that we've heard at the public hearings, I don't believe the uh, local fire departments are really up to speed yet on how to deal mm. with, with um, best facilities. And, uh, you know, I'm concerned and, I, you know, we've editorialized about, I think there's a little bit of a panic going on now. And I think that, that some of what you're seeing uh, when, when people speak about their concerns about this, it gets a little bit overblown and there's a lot of misinformation, I think, floating around. Uh, part of it is that it's happening as there's been a rash of fires from e-bikes and other things that have batteries that are a completely different kind of battery. But at the same time, we had a battery storage facility fire in East Hampton just a couple of weeks ago. So it's pretty clear that there is a risk. And the the big point that opponents have been making, I think, is that this Canal Southampton project is on North Road, which means if you had a bad fire of some kind, generally they require about a half a mile evacuation zone from those facilities when something like that happens. That would encompass both the 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 rail the the, the rail line and County Road 39. So it, it's it's a little. That's what I think people are worried about is the location of that being sort of at a nexus of a lot of the uh, transportation sites. But when you talk to folks, and we had a podcast with John Bouvier uh, from the town, and he pointed out that the fire in East Hampton was extinguished with no real real issues. The system worked. They have fire suppression systems in these facilities and that that would be the case here. The counter argument to that is this is a much bigger facility than the one 
in East Hampton. So there's a lot going on here. There's there, there's an active conversation taking place, and I think it's getting clouded by some of the there, there were some real panicked uh, testimony at that hearing. And I, I, I'm not sure it needs that. Uh, I'm not sure we're to that point, but uh, it's clearly upsetting some folks, Beth. There's, a, you know, people in Hampton Bays, I think, you know, the point was made, you know, that that they feel kind of put upon. And this being the first Hamlet that's going to deal with with a best facility, it won't be the last, but it's going to be the first. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, the, the chemistry is evolving and the fire suppression systems are evolving. Um, I mean, the big major fire that a lot of people um, reference is one that happened in Surprise, Arizona in 2020. Um, it was using um, batteries that contain cobalt, which this one wouldn't. Um, and these particular batteries were that caught fire in Arizona were ha have been known since to have issues with them. Um, that facility also, all the batteries were in one unit, like a server room. So they they were right next to each other and they just went down the line and, and started a thermal runaway. A lot of the newer systems, they're compartmentalized. When you look at this site plan for the one in Hampton Bays, it's 30 separate compartments that each have their own fire suppression system. Mm. In theory, um, and under, Underwriters Lab has tested this in the lab, so it's not totally in theory, but th this type of fire suppression system works a lot better. And that was four firefighters were injured in, in Arizona. That, that's the primary one that involved injuries. Now there, there's obviously still more we have to learn about this technology. Yeah. Um, and, and, yeah. and more, that, and more that, that we need to educate too, right? I mean, I, I think yeah. there's... There's there's been some some disinformation, you know, it, you know, from from that panic. But there's also been, you know, I mean, the you know, town officials have, have come in and, you know, and 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 so while that's all nonsense. But, you know, there's there I think it's lacking on both sides. The, you know, officials yeah. could do more to educate the public and and um, and and the public could do more to to learn about, you know, what's what, what the technology is today. And And one thing. I really like to kind of add to this is, is, you know, most of our streets and dense areas around here have natural gas pipelines throughout, mm -hmm. you know, downtown areas mm -hmm. and fire departments routinely, if there's some kind of gas leak need to um, need to, you know, shut down an area around where this gas leak is for hours and sometimes all day until national grid shows up and turns off the gas. And that's a, it's a that's an incredibly volatile situation that fire departments out here deal with on a regular basis. And yeah. you don't really hear about it because we know how to deal with it. But if, um, if any of that were to blow up, it would be a much bigger deal than um, a battery energy say. And Definitely, and it's every just type part of, of energy generation has unique risks, risks. to it. Yeah. It's part I, of I, I heard a comparison that you know when when <laughs> when when they first when they first started mass producing automobiles and putting in gas stations on every every corner, there was the same concern and panic that you know this gas station could could blow up you've got you know storing all this you know the gas and 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 i'm sure it was a big concern back at that point but you know you you learned how to how to deal with it and, and technology hopefully you know at that time you know was, was employed to help contain you know that type of thing but there's always a risk there's always a risk with with um with technology and energy and, and, you know, and whatever we do. What is that? What is Southampton zoning? I'm sorry, Joe. What does Southampton zoning say about where these facilities can be located? I think one of the problems is that the town really didn't have, uh, they weren't really prepared to, to make those kinds of calls. And I think that's one of the reasons they want the moratorium. I, well, I, I think it. No, the, Southampton put is it was actually kind of a head. Southold has a moratorium on battery storage systems now to draft a code and and in order to draft a code according to NYSERDA guidelines. Southampton did that process in 2020 and they got almost no public feedback because it was during right. COVID during the middle of the pandemic. Yeah, but I, it I, included mistake, several but... residential zones, uh, including this one, which I think is R60 acre and a half zoning. Um, and I think a lot of people would have would have spoken up at the time if they'd known that this was going to be allowed in residential areas. I mean, yeah. the, the one that sparked 
the moratorium in Southwold is in an industrial zone. I, I'm, I'm that, not 100 percent clear yeah. on it, but but when we did the podcast, um, you know, they, they talked to these these facilities need to be near the the transmission lines and you know and, and and all that so that that does come into play you can't just put it out in the middle of nowhere not that we've got a lot of middle of nowheres left in <laughs> in Southampton town but but I mean they have to be along you know the the proper transmission lines and and near you know near facilities that can that can you know take the take the energy right they they have to be near a, a a substation or right. have or be able to build their own substation or sub, right. sub, substations i mean that's what they have to get the they have to be able to get the energy from the grid and then put it back into the grid and it generally requires a substation from my understanding so um that you know in in theory that would would limit where these things can be cited um but a couple of things. I mean, they can build a substation like was proposed in, in Southhold um, in Cutchog, right? On um, uh, Oregon Road. Uh -oh. Oregon, Oregon Road. Thank Rose. you. Yeah, I yeah. just draw a blank. Uh, <laughs> no problem. We've seen that happen all before. And, and a lot of times substations are near um, residential areas. And a lot of times the residential areas that are near facilities like that are, um, you know, low income areas or areas that, you know, are. Uh, like classic environmental justice areas. And mm -hmm. I mean, I feel like that's really important for us to keep in mind as well. Like, you know, how many things are you going to kind of load up? On? I mean, you know, that's mm -hmm. the way, you know, there's there's a I mean, lot of residential development near gas facilities and electric substations in Riverhead. And, you know, if you look at that, if you look at that development, um, you know, you that it's classic in terms of you know the type of housing and the people who are living there um so and yeah. that is an issue that the opponents have brought issue. up in That's hampton Bay. Yeah. beth i'm curious is the rescue the fire and rescue community having a conversation about this actively um what's what's the feeling is this a legitimate concern and is there uh, you know is the training available for dealing with these kinds of facilities uh, do you, do, is, is that something that needs to happen if we're going to have them in our midst? Um, it's definitely something the fire service is concerned about. Um, it's also something that um, they don't really have a lot of information about. There are training classes that are offered by the Suffolk County Fire Academy. Um, one of the issues is you can't really train on a live fire involving this because um, it's not practical to create mm -hmm. such a fire it would be um, very dangerous that's one of the yeah. one of the risks is that the fires uh the fire that that you mentioned in 2020 burned very hot and and for a very long time right right i mean a lot of the new systems they're saying you know because they have the fire suppression system really the fire department's role when they arrive at them is to evacuate and um just be on standby um while the fire suppression system does its work and with some of the i, I mean and that's what happened and, in and east the, hampton in, yeah in and east it takes hampton, a while right? to burn out so yeah. the fire department's standing around there for a while feeling a little bit ineffective um the fire department in while, east hampton never even uh never entered the building never right. got into the building even it wasn't it wasn't required to right they would have been advised not to yeah so I assume that a, that a moratorium, if Southampton Town enacts one, is partially designed to allow the fire departments to get up to speed, and and uh, that would be one of the one of the issues, right? It would give the fire departments a chance to get training and and to get a little more information about it. Yeah, and the uh, the Suffolk County Fire Academy has been really um, helpful in providing that those kinds of resources, but most of the training really is classroom training, which is is um a little nerve-wracking for people who really want the hands-on if, if you want hands-on experience with it you have to go to underwriters lab in ohio which mm. doesn't really i mean do volunteer fire department training in in addition you know any of these uh battery energy uh, storage systems uh that access state grant funding through nicerta um also have access to trainings for local governments in terms of um uh how to it how they can update their zoning or in uh, how um 
how to train on fire safety and, and other uh, resources there. You know, a, a lot of this is, of course, as you said, from the push of off uh, offshore wind, but also, you know, our large scale solar projects that are really leading the way in terms of what our renewable energy future looks like. Um, energy storage is going to be the thing that is going to be required for the eventual shift away from fossil fuel energies. And, you know, uh, one of the things to keep in mind is, you know, as offshore wind is being developed, there's not going to be a moment where we're going to flip a switch and we're going to stop relying on one source of energy and totally switch over to another. Um, there's going to be a long bridge period. And in order for that bridge period to work, there needs to be energy storage um, to be able to wean us from one source to another over time. Mm -hmm. I mean, we see this with um, the small scale batteries that uh, people install on their personal property. I mean, mm -hmm. there are not many of them. I think uh, the one of the latest reports from PSCG Long Island said that there are only about a thousand uh, of these small scale systems that are attached to residential properties or commercial properties um, and me that are that are not big box office kind of structures. Um, we're talking about like small business or or personal property. And uh, most of those systems are more on the east end than they are in the rest of Long Island. So yeah. there are some of these uh, lithium battery systems that are installed on personal property already and uh, PCG um, substations have small battery systems in their storage uh, in the substations already for when there's a power outage. And that way, um, w when a system is down, it converts to storage power. So that way, not everybody loses all system power. Um, and so those are already a fire risk that would have to be dealt with if that was to come um uh, 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 to fruition, such as like if there was to be a large scale flood situation that uh, ripped through a substation. Um, we saw that during Superstorm Sandy. Um, so, you know, uh, how it's out there. Emer we, we how have... emergency services deal with these uh, with these situations have has been an ongoing process. Um, it's really just these larger scale battery systems that are being considered here. I mean, if if a fire department winds up at a house that has one of these storage devices in there, uh, I, I don't know if you install them in an attic, but for the sake of this, if it's in an attic, they would still have to deal with what this problem would be. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot, as you said, there are a lot of homes throughout the South Fork that already have these units installed in garages and other places, if you see a house with solar panels on it, it probably has uh, something like that in it. Denise, you, we, before we move on, we should probably mention too, you had, you had mentioned the disposal of these batteries is going to be an issue moving forward. And, uh, you know, not to mention just, how, you know, it's changed the nature of uh, having to mine for the for the elements that are used in putting these batteries together has become sort of an environmental thing. I find it kind of ironic that this environmentally positive thing has risks and has environmental impacts all its own. It's a whole different animal. Well, I mean, you know, once upon a time, nuclear power was held out as a great environmental savior too, you know, because it's not polluting the air. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I mean, there, you know, there's, as JD just pointed out, there are, you know, um, ramifications to everything that we do. And, um, you know, this it, it, you have to do that cost benefit analysis i guess but um but yeah the, i mean you know these these batteries from e-bikes and things um you know are proliferating i was just looking at a couple of batteries this morning that i had bought um for um you know rechargeables for our digital cameras and you know they don't have that ul listed uh, mm. <laughs> uh symbol on them you know so i've got to dispose of them now um Somehow. You know, <laughs> I, so Riverhead is talking about uh, a, a code amendment that would require all batteries uh, sold and uh, offered for sale in the town to, to be UL listed batteries. Um, you know, whether that that's within the town's authority to do or whether uh, it's 
you know, feasible in terms of any sort of, you know, hope to enforce anything like that remains to be seen. But, um, you know, that. I think there were a bunch it. of Prime Day sales on um, UL listed batteries going. <laughs> that's, on. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's an issue. And and when yeah. you know these all these batteries need to be recycled when they're past their useful life, but then when they're damaged, um, that presents a problem for recycling also. And then they need to be otherwise managed and disposed of. And uh, we had an issue here in Riverhead and uh, the town of Riverhead and the hamlet of Matterville, where um, the e-bike store batteries that caught fire in um, the Lower East Side of Manhattan were uh, shipped, to, uh, transported by an environmental cleanup company um, to their their facility in Manorville for to temporarily hold there until they could, um, you know, find a place to to put them or recycle them or otherwise dispose of them. They're technically, I guess, at that point a form of hazardous waste. Um, they, they noted, the, the town fire marshal noted, noted that in um, transporting from Manhattan to um, Manorville, which they did on a Saturday night, um, <laughs> it, um, it, it uh, they caught fire twice. They had to stop where they were and, oh my and God. the batteries caught fire twice on the wow. way out. Um, so that's how like, you know, kind of volatile and unpredictable they can be, I guess. Um, and that that fire resulted in a death of four residents in the home above the, in the building above the, uh, the that's the, in the, the lower shop. side. Of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, uh, you know, I think it's also perfectly valid for, um, you know, localities out here to use their zoning power to uh, regulate where, you know, these these types of things can be stored. I mean, you know, in, in Riverhead, we have a number of multifamily, you know, uh, four or five story buildings, you know, can they bring their e-bikes into their apartments to keep them there? Um, you know, I mean, if not, then what, what can they do with them? What can they mm -hmm. store them somewhere secure? I mean, these are real issues that really need to, you know, be addressed because, um, you know, a, a, a fire in one of those buildings can be uh, just as devastating, you know, when you have a lot of people living in close quarters. And uh, so those are things I think that all the all the local officials really need to, you know, come to grips with and, and try to work on. I think that, you know, regulating what kind of rechargeable batteries are sold in stores is probably beyond their their scope. But but, um, but how they're used and how they're stored is but, is but yeah I mean you know like requiring that buildings maybe you know I, well I don't know but like these multi-story buildings actually provide you know some kind of secure lockers for storage outside of the building for storage of bikes I don't know that's just I mean a lot of people buy off-market batteries for power tools mm -hmm. on the internet and that's really like an education thing like if you knew this thing could kill your children you wouldn't buy it right. You know, and that's the also, thing. Is, yeah. There's so many yeah. different. Go ahead, JD. Sorry. No, I was going to yeah. say. Also, the other thing to note is that you know we started this conversation about whether or not a moratorium uh, could be or would be in place. Is that using that time to consider what you know uh, what locally should be done in terms of fire safety and stuff like that is important uh, local zoning. But you know the these communities are not the only ones across the country that are dealing with these same questions. I mean, um, province. Uh, town in Massachusetts just opened a 25 megawatt uh, lithium ion battery system. Um, it's a very similar uh, demographic and type of commu coastal community to that of uh, the east end of Long Island. Um, they had similar opposition and now that is open. So what kind of questions did they go through in order to figure out mm -hmm. um, some of the uh, uh, some of those same questions, knowing that that's another uh, community that is also having uh, some of the nation's first offshore wind right in their backyard. You know, there are only really uh, fewer than 10 states uh, across the country that have some kind of energy storage um, goal whatsoever. Many of them are coastal communities that are looking at um, solar and wind as as their energy futures. Um, but so there's not a ton to compare to at this time. Um, so what is being considered in Hampton Bays and South Hold and, and, and uh, East Hampton and elsewhere are really, you know, uh, paving the path for others, but there is somewhere to learn from. 
Yeah, I think it's a fair point to end on, which is this best debate is probably coming to a community near you. Uh, mm. These are going to be needed in, in a lot of other communities. So this is not an isolated conversation. No question. I, about I, it. I would I would be remiss if I didn't take a minute here to point out that Riverhead has zoned for it so that there are zoning use districts in Riverhead where these facilities are allowed. Riverhead has a ton of, um, you know, commercial utility mm-hmm. scale solar uh, facilities and um, they have they have zoned for and has and they've entertained so, well sort of but they've got two different proposals for uh, best facilities utility scale best facilities already kind of in the hopper uh, not really formal applications yet but in that pre pre application conference stage so mm. yeah it's it's uh, definitely a thing and I mean you know we need to be able to provide battery storage. If these other, if this alternative energy, you know, is really going to work, it, mm-hmm. it needs to be sustainable, and that's the that's the ticket. So uh, we got to work this out. Our power needs have uh, consequences. It's it's just something we're going to have to deal with. This is behind the headlines on WLIWFM. I'm Joe Shaw. My co-host is Bill Sutton. We're with the Express News Group. Our panelists today are Denise Civiletti of Riverhead Local. Beth Young of the East End Beacon and J.D. Allen from WSHU Public Radio. J.D., uh, you want to talk about the the composting proposal in East Hampton Town. This is uh, not a new thing. It's something that came up recently in another East End uh, community. Uh, Talk a little bit about this is this is about uh, food waste, right? Yeah, I mean. Trash on Long Island is something that's going to be incredibly important topic over the next uh, couple of months and even years. Um, uh, Riverhead um, Town introduced a pilot program for its um, compost program back in May. Uh, I think Riverhead Local had that first. And uh, now East, the town of East Hampton has a compost program that's going to uh, be available to East Hampton residents um, at a few far, farmers markets uh, this year. They're trying to use that as a way to um, draw people in. Um, both programs are by sign up. Um, the town of Southhold has had a program, a pilot program um, for a little while now. And I think there's even another proposal on um, uh, Southampton to get a similar one done. It's important to note that all East End towns, they cart all of their waste really out of the region um, in one way or another. I mean, some waste is dealt with uh, locally. A lot of these uh, towns have facilities that deal with some organic waste, like leaves and branches and other kind of debris. But when it comes from organic waste, like food scraps, these compost programs uh, could really uh, benefit in diverting waste that would normally go to uh, transporta- uh, transportation that would go to a facility that would be burned somewhere else in the state or another state uh, before it's landfilled. Um, this is a way that uh, some of that food scraps can be broken down in local composts and then given back to the community, whether it be individual residents or agriculture uh, or uh, public spaces as a way to soften things like um, stormwater surges and, and the like. It's not an insignificant amount of the waste stream too, right? Yeah, it makes up. So, um, you know, every town has it a little bit different. Um, you know, the, the East End has a little bit uh, of a restaurant scene, a little bit of an agriculture scene that sh- certainly produces a little bit more uh, organic waste, uh, about 30% of the waste stream is organic waste. Um, mm. If you just take a look at the town of East Hampton, it carts away uh, at about three hundred thousand dollars worth. Uh, I mean, it they spend about three hundred thousand dollars carting away organic waste each year. Um, so that money can be uh, better saved if that is redirected into local composting. Um, save some money, also help um, rejuvenate local soils and, you know, create stormwater buffers. How, do, how does the pilot program work? I mean, what, yeah, what are so, nuts and bolts? Yeah, nuts and bolts. Um, you have to sign up. There's a, a link online that you can go to. Um, you can also sign up in person. Uh, there's going and you, to you bring you bring your waste. There's drop off sites. Huh? 
Yeah, yeah they're, they're going to drop our sites. Sites. Yeah. So you can sign up online and then you can get the tools to be able to do it. Or you can sign up at these farmers markets. It's going to be at the Sag Harbor Farmers Market and the Springs Farmers Markets on Saturdays from July through September. And so if you sign up in person, for instance, you can um, find out what kind of uh, small food pail you need to uh, purchase or have. Um, sometimes these are just, you know, decaled for the particular program that you're in. Mm. Um, I know some other um, in some other towns that compost, they, you know, put it in their extra bathroom garbage that they've converted into a tabletop uh, uh, deal and bring it to composting. Um, but yeah, the nuts and bolts is really just separating out the things that can be compostable. Um, so taking out your, of course, your plastic and your papers. Uh, but, uh, you know, preserving some of your meats and veg that can be broken down. Hmm. Beth and Denise, how are the existing programs doing? Do you, are, you, are they, uh, they're up and running already, right? Well, uh, there's, there, there's a program in Riverhead, like JD mentioned, that started in May, that kicked off in May. And um, they, I, you know what, we haven't really like touched base with them to see how they did a pilot program before they started this, and then we we haven't touched base since May to see um, how it's what going. Kind of, sure. What kind of volume they're getting? I mean, the drop off site is um, sort of off the beaten path. They haven't gotten to the point, as far as I know, where you know there are other drop off locations that are more conveniently located. I mean, I know from um, you know, work that I did with the town years ago uh, to develop a, a recycling program here that, you you know, you, you got I've, you, you to make it as easy as possible for people or they're mm -hmm. not going to do it. And um, so, I mean, even when it's easy, you kind of need a little, you know, a little bit of the stick along with the carrot to make them do it. But um, so the, the drop off facility is at on Young's Avenue, which is near. The, uh, in Calverton, uh, near the former uh, Riverhead landfill, which was really just a dump. It wasn't really a landfill per se, but, um, and, um, you know, you bring your things there. I mean, we, we, you know, we've been composting and I've been composting food waste here at our house for years. Um, I recently bought um, a, a little tumbler thing, um, you know, mm -hmm. And so I could have it right outside the kitchen door, sort of, um, which, you know, in my in my golden years makes it a lot easier, especially in winter <laughs> <laughs> and traveling out to the compost pile. But um, but, you know, not everybody is has the space to do that and, and the ability to do that. So the idea is, that you know, having these community compost um, facilities you know, allow people who live in apartments, who live in, you know, uh, mobile home parks and things to, to be able to do that and divert all this waste from, from the waste stream, which costs money. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's the right thing to do from an environmental standpoint, for sure. So, I think uh, that's we need, we need to follow that up. So, sorry. I, th sorry. I think that's part of the draw that East Hampton yeah. is hoping by making it part of some of their local farmers markets mm -hmm. that they'll get more participation um, from folks that want to go to that. Um, I know that uh, the Riverhead program is uh, through Long Island Organics, which is uh, one of the groups that's helping to run it, um, you know, is trying to find a better way for um, restaurants and some of those um, other uh, facilities that produce a lot of food scraps uh, to find ways to uh, get the food scraps um, and food donations to where they, you know, need to go. Um, so maybe there's like some kind of um, volunteer service that will help them bring it off the beaten path to Young's Avenue's uh, site. And um, the program in East Hampton really kind of mirrors what um, Riverhead did before it opened its facility in May. Um, Calverton and the Calverton Civic Association um, was uh, running something that's similar to what's now in East Hampton. Um, and at the end of their couple month uh, period, they were able to divert nearly two tons of uh, food scraps um, into compost, which is small, but um, is a step in the right direction. 
Yeah, and absolutely. because the drop off site is located in Calverton, it's near the people who initially participated in that too. So they'll probably be the most likely to use it. The South Hole did a pilot um, back in 2020. Um, one of the things that I think this this really works in areas that um, people already go to a transfer station with their recycling. Um, like mm -hmm. Riverhead is the only That's town out point. here that has municipal pickup, and to have a separate bin for food scraps at the pickup, I don't know how that would work with the carters. It would probably blow their minds, and everybody's going to have like a little <laughs> container too. Um, so, um, but in in Southold, everybody brings their garbage to Kutchog, they, you know, and the same thing in Southampton and I believe East Hampton as well. I mean, mm -hmm. except mm -hmm. I, I'm sure you, they have a lot of people who get a private people have to pick it up. Parties, but, but it's, there's still a, a great number of people. Who yeah. And the Matatech Laurel Civic Association is having a discussion on July 31st at 6 30 PM at Veterans Beach about um, trying to do this um, on a permanent basis in Southold. So there's, there's an effort afoot here. You know, a I bunch of it. your a bunch of your papers had reported earlier this year when there was a town supervisor summit, you know, that waste is going to be something they're really going to have to figure out, um, you know, uh, between a new draft proposal from New York State um, and, you know, the growing amount of waste that we produce locally, you know, the the model of taking your trash and carting it, you know, upstate or out of state is really going to be discouraged and disincentivized. Um, you know, it, it's a big producer of uh, greenhouse gases um, and then landfilling that waste that's probably burned into ash. That burning process is another greenhouse gas emitter. Landfilling it is a 30 year uh, mm -hmm. greenhouse gas emitter. Um, and so, you know, New York is going to really look towards um, local uh, governments to try to reduce, reuse, and recycle uh, the waste that it produces. And organic waste is really, um, in some ways, some of the easier things to deal with and makes up a large percent of the garbage that's produced. It'll be notable to see what, what uh, East Hampton, if it catches on in East Hampton, and I think uh, it's something we'll have to keep an eye on. Uh, this is Behind the Headlines on WLIWFM. I'm Joe Shaw. My co-host is Bill Sutton. We're with the Express News Group. Uh, that was J.D. Allen. He's with WSHU Public Radio. Uh, we have Beth Young, who's the editor of the East End Beacon. And we have Denise Civiletti, who's the editor of Riverhead Local. So um, let's go back to Southhold, Beth. Uh, there's a move on there to take a little bit of an action uh, to deal with some of the illegal rentals. Can you talk about what Southhold's looking to do? Well, uh, I think this is a problem throughout the East End that you know the towns have adopted codes to try and um, limit Airbnb and short-term rental type websites um, from, I mean, there are a lot of people who buy houses now just to rent them on Airbnb. Um, mm -hmm. And it's really depleting a lot of the long-term housing stock. It's adding to a lot of our affordable housing um, woes out here. Uh, Southold is looking to uh, increase the fines very significantly for uh, renting without a permit and require that the, per the that a rental permit is displayed in all advertising for um, for rentals. Um, and the fines, I think it's it used to be five hundred dollars minimum, and now it's going up to it would be going up to three thousand. They're having a public hearing on August 29th about this. Um, one of the other things is people are renting out their swimming pools. I guess you guys had mentioned that on the South Fork as well through through online services as well. Um, now, Southfield currently has a limit of 14 days. Um, you can't rent a property for less than 14 days. Uh, and people get around that rule by renting it for a weekend and then not renting it again for for the following weekend. And then they rent it again the next weekend and just saying that that's a 14 day period. So uh, Southfield Town Supervisor has really been pushing to make that a 30-day period. Um, he's gotten some pushback ah. from other members of the board, so that's not um, something that they're currently putting up for public hearing, but it's something that many on the town board are looking seriously into. So that might be coming down at some point. I guess Riverhead is already 30 days, is that right? Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I mean, I don't know how, you know, you can... You <laughs> 
You would never know it by looking at the VR vacation rentals by owner or the Airbnb websites, however, but yeah, go on. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, (laughs) enforcement is always the issue. with Enforcement becomes the the challenge there. Yeah, Yeah. but so is this a relatively new phenomenon? I mean, you know, when we talked about illegal rental properties 15 years ago, it was about basement apartments and, and apartments without permits, which obviously is part of the conversation that we're talking about here. But it really is mostly about these really short-term rentals. Is that is that fair to say? At this point, yes. Um, yeah. And that's it's because it's taking those properties off of the rolls for year-round rentals, right? Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm sure I'm sure you're all dealing with it. Um, pe- I mean, people out, out here are desperate for places to live. Um, there's nowhere for people to live year-round. Yeah, absolutely. If you don't own a home, um, and you know, if you think you have a secure rental, your landlord and your landlord finds out how much more they could be making. You know, it's it's just not economically. Long-term rentals are not something they're willing to entertain anymore. It's, yeah, you know, they, they, you know, they don't even okay. care that it's illegal because there's the fine. You know, the fines are nothing compared to what you could earn. Um, Hence them wanting to increase the fines, but yeah. but yeah, I mean it's it's attractive, right? Rather than having to deal with a with a tenant three hundred and sixty five days a year, if you can make the same amount of money in you know in in ten or twelve weekends over over the summer, um, you know, I, I mean that's got to be hard to hard to turn down. I mean, the wildest part of the story, though, yes. The, the rental home, but the rental pool part was the, yeah. was the piece that <laughs> I was really stuck on. Wow. Yeah. People are renting pools. Yeah. yeah there's a, a, there's an, an app an, for that. An, <laughs> an, hour, an, an hourly rate. You can come in and rent a, rent a pool for a hundred bucks an hour or for an afternoon for 300 bucks for, you know, we wrote a story about it for, you know, for three hours, you want to have a pool party if your place doesn't have a pool. And, you know, I think it, uh, if I remember right, the app limits the number of of guests you you can bring in, or you pay more more for that. And I just can't imagine if I was a homeowner with a pool to to to, to have all these strangers come in and utilize the pool for for five hundred. Yeah, bucks. How do you home. tell them? Sorry, that's too many people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and where do they go to the thing. bathroom? Can I just say? Yeah, like, I don't. We have the pool. <laughs> No, it's a very. Ew. <laughs> <laughs> they go to the county parks. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, this is a commercial use of residential property. Like exactly. You know, yeah. I I'm sorry that I'm like the zoning nerd here, <laughs> but you know, like that really is what it is. It's a commercial use of residential property, just like the Airbnb thing is. I mean, you know, it's. A Are we open issue. to the argument at all that the Airbnb? Uh, contributes to affordable housing in that it makes housing affordable for people who live here already and they can rent out airbnb and and be able to afford to stay here is uh, are we are we are we we accepting that accessory apartment or if it was otherwise owner occupied and they went and camped that weekend or something but (laughs) As Beth pointed out, you have a lot of people buying houses just to do this. I mean, we've seen that here in Riverhead. I can only just imagine in other East End towns, you know. Yeah. And I, I, I don't. I think that the affordable rentals that are lost to this use um, it far outstrip the uh, the the people who are able to actually live in their homes because they can rent it out for a period of time in season. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, there's I, I, just there's an argument that some on the town board in Southfield are making that, you know, we have very few hotels up here and the price per night in season is, I don't know, $700,000 for a hotel room. So we're a tourism centric economy. Where do people stay when they come out here? Are they just going to come in as day trippers and then you're welcome to the East End Traffic Festival? So. Yeah. Um, we're a victim of our own success. <laughs> Just another way of trying to deal with it. Bill, we have yeah. a couple minutes left. I wanted to, to touch briefly on a story we did about East Hampton and concern about the woodlands um, heading out uh, east uh, of East Hampton Village. Uh, 
it's about the southern pine beetle, but it's not just about the southern pine beetle. Right. So, I mean, that's a familiar story that, you know, that we've written about for years is the devastation from the from the southern pine beetles and, and you know, and, and the, you know, the loss of, of trees in, in those woodlands. Um, you know, often often creating fire hazards as well as a, as a side note because the trees are felled and 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 they're not removed. But we're seeing, you know, we're seeing other other um, other challenges, um, um, other different kind of in, invasive uh, species and 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 predators. Um, the beech trees in in the region have um, have have fallen to a new a new predator. Uh, um, a, a nematode, I guess, is, mm-hmm. is the correct. I don't know if that's the correct pronunciation, but it's a it's a microscopic worm um, that causes uh, beech leaf disease. Beech leaf disease that that's killing uh, many p- plants. The spotted lantern fly we've seen come in um, just recently over the last year or two that that is having the same effect. Um, but we also heard from um, um, uh, at, at a town board meeting in, in East Hampton um, that one of um, the, that in, uh, let me catch my breath. So that the, the the forests aren't able to regenerate themselves because of another um, un, unforeseen um, challenge, and that's the white-tailed deer. Which we've we've all known has been an overpopulation on the east end for for a long time, but the deer come in and they eat the little seedlings and saplings, so the the uh, the woodlands aren't aren't regenerating as as they normally would. And so there was talk about how do you control that that deer population, and that's been an ongoing battle, um, you know, on the east end for as long as I've been around. Is you know, do you? Is there a way to cull the population? Can you can you try to you know uh, you know control them through through other means? Um, you know um, there were were efforts to um, to try to keep them from having little baby deers and, and just all kinds of efforts over over the years that that have been kind of successful and and unsuccessful. So I thought that was it was it was interesting because you hear about all these little you know microscopic or bugs or or whatever but the the deers are having a real effect on on not allowing these forests to to repopulate themselves and beth we're heading into sort of peak brush fire season right uh a lot of it's usually in the spring but anytime, oh, is, right? is, fire, anytime is fire season now yeah i would think and and with the hot summer and and yeah um we're getting more and more drought conditions here and there we just entered a moderate drought on thursday and then it started raining so Mm -hmm. hopefully it will rain unless we need a little help a little help except don't tell the chamber of commerce yes exactly but we need it for the other reasons (laughs) we're out of time uh i want to thank our panelists this week denise civiletti of riverhead local beth young of east end beacon and jd allen of wshu uh, and also thanks to my co-host, Will Sutton, from the Express News Group. I'm Joe Shaw. We'll be back next week with another edition of Buying Deadlines. Thanks, guys.